I am Dave Pauly, and I have been seeking a humane economy. So what exactly is a humane economy? If you follow the economy at all, you've probably heard terms like a bull market or a bear market. Well, today I'm talking about a little different type of a bear market. It's one where the bear sees human habitats as its grocery market. And historically, when bears like this came into our farmsteads, our outbuildings to do their shopping, there were really only two solutions. They could either shoot and kill the bear, or they could catch it in a culvert trap and take it out and release it elsewhere. The problem with the latter is that that really is only transferring a problem bear to another area. So it's an expensive procedure, and it really doesn't, uh, isn't in the best interest of the humans, where the bear is being released, or in the best interest of the bear. So the humane economy model for bear control still involves catching a problem bear um, at the, at the site where the problem is and then releasing the bear at that capture site, but not before exposing it to negative stimuli, in this case, the Karelian bear dogs. And this particular bear required also some rubber bullets and some additional noise <laughs> to get him to leave. But what we're doing is teaching this bear, we're reinforcing for this bear to not come down to human habitation, but we're not taking him out of his ecosystem so he can still go up in the hills and live. Um, we're also teaching an adult bear that he wants to avoid humans, but hopefully all the female bears are also going to teach their future cubs to avoid the lights and the grain bins and the chicken coops of human beings. So it really is um, uh, an encompassing of the hum humane, humane economy model that says that sometimes doing the right thing can also be the most profitable thing. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, I'm using wildlife model to explain the humane economy. But this concept also applies to domestic animals, to farm animals, even to soil-based agriculture. And the real take-home point is that um, you can be humane and be more profitable. So I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, use three other species as examples to reinforce the humane economy. But I would be remiss if I didn't give a little bit of history and also to disclose that this is not my concept. I did not invent the humane economy, but I have worked the last few decades to try to improve it. In fact, my humane economy journey started 50 years and almost a month ago when my dad wrapped my first humane live trap and put it under the Christmas tree. I took that trap and uh, immediately started to catch animals and soon uh, I was known as the kid who would come on his bicycle and catch any mink, skunk, raccoon that was bothering any other pigeon fanciers, because I raised show pigeons. So um, poultry producers, anybody who had a wildlife conflict could call me and I'd go catch that animal. And I got very good at it. And then one day, I, I said to my dad, I've been seeing this orange tomcat hanging around our pigeon loft for about a week, and I'm going to trap it. And my dad gave me my first humane economy lesson. He said, well, is that cat stalking the pigeons? Is he expressing interest in the pigeons? And I said, no, he's just hanging around the loft. And my dad said, well, sometimes it's better to live with a cat that we know than to remove that cat and maybe get another cat in who is definitely going to kill your pigeons. It took me a couple of years to absorb that concept, but he really was talking about tolerance and coexistence, and thinking about those concepts as we go with wildlife. So, um, the, so then I, I, trapped, I trapped and caught animals both as a hobby and commercially. But about 14 years later, I started a business in Madison, Wisconsin called Humane Animal Controls. And I dealt with all types of urban wildlife conflicts. And at the same time, I was going to school full time to become an agricultural economist. And it was this joint thing of spending half the day dealing with people's wildlife problems and half the day learning the theory of economy that really cemented the, my foundation for this humane economy movement. And uh, you know, generally, when, it, when a person has a raccoon in their chimney or bats in their attic or squirrels in the house, they really only want one thing. They want them gone. They want the animals gone. And that has created a whole, a whole industry of sometimes inhumane and sometimes inefficient 
uh, models that are band-aids. They don't solve the problem. They remove the animal, which the person is happy with, but they don't solve the underlying problem of why is that animal there in the first place. They also are inefficient because we're spending all the time and all the energy to uh, remove the animal and not solve the problem. And Mother Nature will provide, she'll replace the squirrel or the beaver or the raccoon that we take out. So it becomes unsustainable because eventually the cost of all that removal is going to exceed the value of the property that we're trying to protect. So we take all these things, and I'm going to use this example from 1988 that uh, should reinforce them. This is a rabies, uh, there's a rabies outbreak in Yellowstone County, and uh, I was the director of animal control, and the State Department of Agriculture asked me if I would train a team to put out strychnine eggs to poison the skunks. Well, I went to the training, but I immediately from the get-go recognized that this was an unsustainable thing. It was more likely to kill other wildlife and pet dogs and cats, and it did not address the key issue that people should be vaccinating their dogs and cats for rabies rather than going after the skunks. Uh, in fact, this skunk here is a female wild skunk uh, in Billings. She has been uh, uh, injected with birth control, nor plant birth control, uh, has a radio collar on, and she's released at the site of capture. But before we got to this, our non-poisoning team that we developed was to educate people about vaccination, and it was to go out and trap skunks and humanely euthanize them. We didn't have an option. We weren't going to poison them. When we did that, the major lesson learned was that in year one, of all the skunks that we captured and euthanized, about uh, the average litter size of those skunks was just about five skunks, 4.8 kits per litter. A year later, when we went out and did it the second time before contraception, the litter size had grown to 6.5. So year one, 4.8, year two, 6.5. This was mother nature filling that void. She was just gonna fill it. So truly killing skunks was not the solution to rabies control. Another example, this one is in Eastern Washington. I was the director of a humane society and I got a phone call from an apple orchardist. And he said, uh, is there a chance you could give me six fully pregnant cats? I don't get that call very often. <laughs> so, so I said, well, what's going on? And he said, well, I have an apple orchard. I'm growing a new apple called the Honeycrisp apple, which we've all probably grown to love. And uh, I have coyotes digging up my irrigation lines to get water. And so I hired a trapper, and he has eliminated all the predators on my property. And so now I have an outbreak of voles, little metal mice. They're all over the place. And I'm thinking if you give me six pregnant cats, I can build cat houses in my orchard. We'll put the cats out there, and they'll stay because they have babies, and they'll eat the voles. Well, maybe. So, um, but he did have the hook in. So of all the things he could do, uh, trapping coyotes, live trapping coyotes, uh, bringing non-native cats in as that solution, and none of them really made sense like they were getting to the problem. I'm hoping you can see what the one picture up there that is the humane economy, and that's taking advantage of the natural beauty of an animal. So I spent time with them, and I recommended stop trapping coyotes. You don't have a coyote problem. You have a water availability problem. In fact, let's give the coyotes what they want. Let's put a pan on the end of each of your irrigation lines and let the coyotes have their water, and then celebrate the coyotes, because they're going to control the voles, the skunks, and all the other animals that you have removed. So by doing nothing else, by simple, oh, I also told them to put up some raptor perches, which are basically just elevated tees so that the, uh, the kestrels and the hawks can hunt the voles in the daytime, and the barn owls and the great horned owls can hunt them from night. So a very natural economy. I said, so just by doing those things, giving them water and raptor perches, you can reduce your cost of goods sold substantially, thereby increasing your profits. So by just doing what was right, he was able to make more money selling apples. Those damning beavers. I deal with a lot of beaver issues. This beaver happens to be at Lake Elmo State Park. Um, and there'll be another slide in a minute talking about this. But I'm going to talk about beavers in North Dakota. Um, last year in North Dakota, uh, the city of Fargo, the county, 
uh, had a beaver problem along the Red River on both public and private lands. And their solution was to uh, sign a contract to have somebody come in and lethally control the beavers. Well, a local group calling themselves the Beaver Backers um, <laughs> called me and said, we need your help. So I went to Fargo and we uh, talked to the uh, facilities commission and I told them that this Beaver Backer group was willing to come out and paint the bottom parts of the trees with an eco-friendly paint that also had about 10% uh, mason sand mixed into it. So it was a gritty, sandy mixture of paint that has been proven time and time again to repel beavers from chewing on the tree, provided you leave enough trees for the beavers to eat. So you can't treat all trees. So uh, the problem, uh, the paint was expensive. It's about $70 a gallon. But when we compared that, the trees need to be painted year one and then again on year three. So the cost of comparing that to lethally trapping the beavers is about one third of the cost over three years. So again, the city could do something that was ecologically friendly, um, not upset a lot of people who like the beavers and still solve the problem. So with beavers, coexistence and beaver deceivers are all good humane economy ways. The picture here on the right is a beaver deceiver that we built in uh, Rocky Mountain State Park, National Park. And uh, it's with Skip Lyle, the designer of this. And it's basically a trapezoidal shaped uh, design that allows, it increases the, the square footage, the surface area, and also allows different water flow so beavers cannot plug them. This one, of course, is missing the wire. We add wire. But that works very well. The picture on the left is actually uh, Lake Elmo, where those beavers developed a real flavor for Russian olive trees. If I could train every beaver <laughs> to like Russian olive trees, they would not be a problem. But truly, coexistence um, uh, solved the problem. So, uh, but humane economy is not just a national or a North American policy, it's an international policy, and there are really more exciting programs going on in Africa and island countries like Trinidad. And this uh, Lion's Guardians photograph, uh, about 5,000 square kilometers of eastern Africa are patrolled by Lion's Guardians uh, employees, and they, uh, they are a culture that for decades depended upon killing lions. That was their method to coexist, was to dominate and kill. And they have now learned that by using modern technology, they can f track the lions, they can uh, move their livestock away from the lions before there's a conflict. And they can just really, they really have learned to teach, in fact, some of them make money as teachers teaching other villages and tourists, and now today you guys, that you can coexist, man and beast can coexist, and it can be done long term. So, uh, and then in Trinidad, there's a very similar program where local islanders are hired to find and protect leatherback sea turtle nests. And uh, so rather than going out and stealing the eggs to feed their families, they are able to uh, make money by taking out tours at night to let people observe these sea turtles lay their eggs. Now, I took that tour two years ago, and uh, my tour guide was so enthusiastic as he told the story about how his family transitioned from being a turtle egg poacher to being a turtle and egg protector. And it really was powerful in that it told me just how life-changing a humane economy could be. Now, I'm going to close with this slide because humane economies are within your reach. This is a prototype, and we're into the second year now, of training raccoons and skunks to learn that eggs come with a cost. So this device is actually a Canadian device designed to exclude black bears from garbage cans. It's powered by two D-cell batteries, and it gives a minor shock when anybody touches uh, the wire grid. So we're using this to put out early in the season so that the raccoons and skunks who come and are interested in an egg learns that maybe grain and mice are a better deal. And so, they, so it, is a, it does involve shocking, but it has some shocking results, we hope. And we hope that this facility 
will, in, in just one or two years, will not have to spend a quarter of their time in the spring trapping and removing predators, that they will actually develop their own humane economy and that they will be able to coexist with those raccoons and, uh, and skunks. So as I close, my question for you is to think about your own wildlife uh, conflicts in your world and, uh, and seek out some of these humane solutions. If you have mice or insects in your cupboard, don't go buy a glue trap. Those glue traps are, 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 are not solving the problem. Uh, find out how those mice and insects are getting into the house. Look at other ways to control them. Uh, it's just your, your wallet and your humane economy can make a difference. And then apply the knowledge you learn. And then lastly, celebrate the results because just by doing a few simple things in your life, you can create your own humane economy. Thank you very much.